So Maggie Warwick, you you are a songwriter of great distinction. You've had uh, cuts and hits and songs of yours recorded over many decades. But I... <laughs> is that yours? <laughs> By the way, I think Alton left mine on. Let me turn one. that off. Um, let's see. Make sure mine's not on. Okay. Anyway, so I'll start that again. So, okay. I can edit this a bit. But so, Maggie Warwick, you're a, a songwriter, singer, and songwriter of a great distinction. You've had many cuts, many covers, and many hits through many decades. But I want to take you right back to the very beginning, because uh, oftentimes it's those moments where history changes in your life that are the things that people know least about. So, tell me your story. How, how did it all start for you as a songwriter? You know, this songwriting, music itself, becomes so much a part of your life. And the simplicity of my life, the way I grew up, uh, it's, it's kind of amazing. You know, every one of us, I believe, have our own story of how we evolved and the links of, that we connected with through our childhood on to where we are today that led us into the music business. It's just amazing how it happens. And for me, of course, I choose to believe it's the hand of God on your life, you know, that brings forth the opportunities in the day and age in which we live in this earth to um, almost just channel you into this life. Um, so it started real simple for me growing up in West Texas. Uh, my daddy was a farmer and my mother, you know, uh, we had a wonderful life. Um, I long for that life, uh, always. Uh, wonderful little community, um, you know, sharing everything, church every Sunday and neighbors and friends, big Sunday dinners, you know, it's just a wonderful time. And then, you know, difficulties in life always happen. It's not a utopia. Uh, the reality of life sets in and difficulties happen and changes your life. But it all blends together to create um, this um, love inside you uh, for your family, for your friends, for life, for um, the meaning, the core meaning of life that, that we yearn for to be our reality and what's authentic in us and meaningful. And uh, of course all those things happened to me. Uh, and growing up we moved into town uh, from the country in a, a little town in West Texas called Level Land, Texas. It's 30 miles west of Lubbock. Of course, this is the real Texas, way out on the Texas Plains, and uh, where you see the sky forever, you know, it goes on and on. It's just this freedom of, of life there, are many, many characters that you grow up with that, that become part of your life expression. And uh, the way you, you see life and um, and in this growing up time, that's a very important part, I think, of anybody's um, life when they get into the creative arts. Uh, we all write what we know. Uh, all the writers, the great writers of novels and, and life itself, they will tell you, you write what you know about. And so that happened to me. And when I was a teenager, junior high school in Level Land, um, of course, I first started singing gospel music, and as one of our great uh, uh, music industry songwriter people, Ralph Murphy said, we learn through osmosis. There was no education system in those days to teach people how to write songs. Uh, you know, there were no classes. But I, and we had the radio, uh, and uh, church, I, I knew every song in the songbook at church. I memorized all of the words. 
And actually, listening to the radio, when you'd hear a hit song like Hank Williams and Lefty Frizzell, uh, which was big in those days, and this was all before Elvis, you know, when we were kids, little kids growing up, and before I could read, I would actually memorize songs on the radio. And when I would hear one I really liked, I would go and we'd, we'd turn it up. And uh, I have two sisters and a brother, and we all sang together. And we'd turn it up, and we would memorize one verse and get that down. And uh, then we would wait. They would play it, you know, several times throughout the day. Oh, it's coming on again. Let's go learn the second verse. And we, would, we learned those lyrics uh, before we could read when we were little kids. And my grandmother was a big influence in my life. She was actually the first music fan that I ever knew. And she would come to our house and stay with us, you know, long periods of time. And she and I were just best buddies. And she would bring her record player. And she had a collection of, of 78 records that she would bring with her. And uh, we would sit, and she loved to rock, and, and we would sit and play those records. And it was a little wind-up player. And when it would start winding down, I would get up and wind the, the record. And we just would spend hours like that. So music was just, it's a, it's a love for music, I think, that you're born with. I'm sure that's the way it is with you, Tony. And uh, so this is like how it forms inside you. Uh, so then in junior high, um, you know, you have all your friends and, and you start being a teenager. And uh, that's when we discovered this, um, um, what they call, uh, well, rock and roll, blues, early roots music of America. And on my way home, uh, every afternoon, I would walk in front of our five and dime store and it was a picturesque west texas town with a courthouse square and all these wonderful uh, shops and cafes on all around the square and we had two five and dime stores so in the back of one of these five and dime stores was um, a rack and it it was uh, had records 45 records and a sign painted on a cardboard, Brenton cardboard, uh, you know, piece part of a box, was written in hand, Crayolas, I'm sure, and it said race records. And I thought, oh wow, this is so cool. So I went in there, and every afternoon I would, I would uh, go in there and check out these records. And the clerks, nobody ever bothered me, you know, we, it was like we all knew each other. And I would get the little 45 record player down and sit in the floor and play these these blues records and rock and roll early rock and roll it was Laverne Baker Ruth Brown Ray Charles the early Atlantic records Imperial all of those labels that's when I first saw uh, the name in the parentheses under the title you know in the old 45s and I thought what is what does that mean that's where I first saw Ahmed Erdogan's name he was a songwriter, you know, and of course, uh, most everyone knows he was the founder of Atlantic Records and went on to do great things, helped create the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and just marvelous things. And I actually got a chance to meet him in, uh, in New Orleans and, and had a wonderful time with, with him. But um, that's what made me become aware of what is this music business? What are these records all about, you know? Uh, so uh, then I would listen to these songs, learn these songs, formed a little band in high school, and my full name is Margaret Lewis Warwick. My husband's name is Warwick, of course. And my family, the Lewis family, are um, pioneer family uh, settlers in West Texas. I'm actually fifth generation. So it was this type of uh, character that I grew up with, the pioneer spirit, believing you could do anything. Uh, West Texas people, uh, you know, they, they built West Texas on faith because it's, it was a barren land and everybody knows dry land and very difficult life, but built 
uh, wonderful towns and, and cities from Fort Worth on. Uh, and it's just this instills this um, faith and courage and belief in you to move out into life to do things. So then, uh, in my early teenage years, discovered uh, this new singer called Elvis Presley was his name. And my sister and I, we were working at the movies. And on Saturday, she, we would have our lunch hour, and we went to this little cafe, and she said, oh, I just heard this record on the radio. It's by this guy. I, don't, I can't remember his name. It was something like Alvis and um, something like that. I said, well, maybe it's on the jukebox. So we went over, and we uh, searched all the names, you know, in the jukebox. She said, oh, here, this must be it, Elvis Presley. And uh, so we... It was a nickel to play records, so we played both sides, and it was Elvis's first record on Sun Records called That's All Right Mama and Blue Moon of Kentucky. And of course, it's history. Uh, that's what changed the world. Elvis Presley and the rockabilly sound, the rhythm and blues, Fats Domino, um, which all the records that came from New Orleans uh, that were cut here, Big Joe Turner, Little Richard, uh, all of those great rock and rolls. And then the rockabilly crowd came in and that was led by Elvis. And then you had Roy Orbison, Carl Perkins, Johnny Cash, all the Sun Records influence. And that's what really got me started. So uh, into um, wanting to do this, you know, wanting to be in the music. So we. Uh, my friends, we had a group of friends in high school. We started a little band. We started playing. Margaret Lewis and the Thunderbolts was our name. We loved to be lively, you know, and and uh, play all this great music. So that's how it began for me. Uh, and uh, the simplicity of music uh, in those roots music days, as they're called today, uh, was just wonderful. All these subjects that they would write about, the songwriters, just covered every area of life experience. You know, it was a reality in the lyrics that people could identify with and that you enjoyed and became part of your life. And Elvis, of course, he, he just broke all the sound barriers. And he was like, with my mother loved Elvis and all of my family. And mama actually uh, thought Elvis was a member of our family. You know, that, that's how she took this in. But, um, and she was, of course, young in those days, in her 30s. And uh, she loved all the, the music and welcomed it into our home. And so we just, um, it just became part of our lives, inseparable. And I've actually written a song, Tony, that I'll have to play for you one time. I mean, sometime. It's uh, called Rockabilly Babies. And it was how, it was kind of, it's kind of the history of how this all happened. And I'm so thankful that I was born during those years and that I actually got to come through the beginning of it and, and know this part of American music. Um, and music basically that we've nailed down to be music of the American South. Uh, it was the culture of the American South and the sufferings and the joys and the, the life that these uh, people back in, you know, the early beginning of, of the century and the 20s and 30s and 40s, the people who created the music of those days when sound recording actually was discovered and the pioneers that would go into these regions and record the, this music uh, direct to disc, you know, there were the Lomax family and Pierre, uh, they would go with, in their cars with these recorders in the back of their cars and drive into the mountains like uh, in uh, Appalachia where they discovered the Carter family. And that was, you know, Johnny Cash's wife, June Carter, and her mother, Maybelle. 
and uh, those kind of people with this original uh, music um, of the mountains that some call bluegrass and folk and you know it's folk life music but then um, you also had the African American influence uh, and these were we were all, all country people this was music that came from our souls of people who grew up in the in the life of uh, agriculture uh, in all its forms across the American South and the blend of the cultures it was the, it was all it, all of us black and white and and of course all of the cultures um, that immigrated into America uh, and there was this great immigration period where people were settling the south and on to the west and it was that force I think that created our music uh, because even you know the Beatles the Rolling Stones uh, all of the great uh, English musicians uh, that uh, that loved this music and really expanded it into global um, you know magnificent recordings uh, it was all from this roots these roots and that's what influenced me uh, so I began writing songs during my teenage years knew not only what I had learned through osmosis and learning from um, what we call church songs in the songbook and lyric formation and and it was actually a form of storytelling uh, and um, and and expressing all of your emotions in a simple way uh, and that is what we've learned through the years has been the most effective as far as uh, writing great songs and being um, uh, able to record it on records that people love and just can't live without and want to rush out and buy. I know we would, uh, when all the Elvis, earlier Elvis records came out on Sun Records, and of course that's because of Sam Phillips, who was the producer of uh, Sun Records, owner of Sun Records, founded uh, the label, built the studio, uh, all of those record label owners, um, they were a big, big influence in American music because it was a new thing. It was a pioneer day, and they actually created the music industry uh, from these raw beginnings of, uh, of this new technology. And then radio, radio was expanding, um, and that was, of course, before my time, but uh, in the 20s and 30s and these big powerful um, AM stations I think they had 10 in America that was were licensed uh, through the FCC uh, and uh, we had one in Shreveport well I'm getting ahead of myself how I came from Texas into Louisiana um, and Tony Feel free to interrupt me and uh, ask me questions if I'm. Uh, <coughs> no, you're doing a great uh, job. But tell me, the, the, when was the first time you got played on the radio? One of your songs played on the radio. Well, that's um, uh, this. This is a good segue then. Uh, when I was in high school, Johnny Horton. You you remember Johnny? He was famous singer of the Louisiana Hayride, and of course. The Louisiana Hayride in Shreveport, Louisiana is where all of these great, the greatest of American artists began. It was Hank Williams, uh, Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, all of the rockabilly group that Sam Phillips brought in. But these wonderful musicians, it was this big radio show, a, a live stage show that happened every Saturday night. It was like a parallel of the Grand Ole Opry. The only difference coming from Shreveport, uh, it, it was much more rambunctious and where the Opry limited itself to performers of more acoustic sounds and mountain music, bluegrass and traditional country, uh, the Louisiana Hayride embraced all of this cutting edge uh, uh, as we use that term today, 
uh, music that was uh, evolving through a blend of the country music and the rhythm and blues music. And so that show became so famous uh, and because of you know those great stars and the sound and it was broadcast over the 50,000 watt station in Shreveport, KWKH. And it would go through, oh, just many, many states all over the, the United States and we would pick it up in, in West Texas. But it was also linked into CBS radio and so people heard it all over the country. And we began as children listening to the Louisiana Hayride. And my mother, you know, they loved all that music and our grandparents. And so that became part of our lives. And when I was in um, high school with my band, Johnny Horton, who was a big star of the Louisiana Hayride, had, had uh, the Battle of New Orleans was his big, huge hit. Honky Tonk Man that Dwight Yoakam later recorded was his big record. He was a singer, songwriter musician and he and his manager Tillman Franks who is also known all over the world as he was a musician and a, and a manager and uh, very savvy uh, but they uh, were going around the country doing these Louisiana Hayride talent shows so we entered one that they were going to have in uh, Texas uh, and uh, it was uh, uh, collaborated with um, our radio station in Lubbock called KDAV, which was the first big country music station that to go all country format. So I wrote a letter asking if we could come and audition. And uh, so we uh, got a letter back from them, don't worry about auditioning, just show up and we, we will put you on the show. So it was very informal back then and it was held at Plainview, Texas. And so, oh, we got all excited and we had a, our own little entourage and we lit out from Level Land to Plainview. And um, so that was where I first, you know, got into meeting someone who was really professional in the music industry. So they wanted me to come to Shreveport and be on the Louisiana Hayride. Uh, and while, when I did that, uh, Tillman Franks and Johnny Horton introduced me to a lady from Shreveport who owned a recording studio. Myra Smith had Ram Recording Studio and she had built it um, just like Sam Phillips. She was a pioneer, she was a songwriter and a musician and her cousin uh, happened to be a guy named Alton Warwick who later uh, I mean, her. Uh, he he later became my husband, but uh, Johnny and and uh, Tillman took me out to meet Myra, and they said, uh, "We want you to meet Maggie. She's uh, a young singer, and we'd like to record some demos." Uh, so we did. We went in her studio, and that's when I met Alton, and uh, we recorded some demos. So she said, "Oh, I'd like to make a record with you and put it on Ram Records." So that was what, uh, what we did uh, later on when my family moved to Shreveport. Uh, then we became close friends with her and her family and Alton and I became uh, very close. And we recorded my first record on Ram Records. And that's when I first heard my, re uh, my record on the radio at, over KWKH. Um, and, was that an original song? Yes, uh -huh. it was a song that um, I wrote with my sister uh, called No No Never and it was a, a little rockabilly song and uh, and it, it got a, quite a bit of airplay and oh we were just all excited. I guess it's one of the most exciting things that can happen to you is to make a record and, and hear it on the radio. Uh, so we had some musicians there from Shreveport who later became quite famous as musicians. Joe Osborne, who became this famous bass player, uh, played with Johnny Rivers and then became a session musician, played with all of the, on all the Simon and Garfunkel records and um, discovered the Carpenters actually when he moved out to LA. He had a little studio in his uh, house and they lived down the street and he recorded their first records. and. Um, uh, so it's people like that. Billy Sanford, who is a 
uh, famous guitar players uh, left, actually left to go on the road with Roy Orbison from Shreveport and Jerry Kennedy. Uh, and uh, Jerry became a great session musician, producer in Nashville, and um, and uh, Billy Sanford became a great session player and played on all those hit records. They were the two guitars, actually, that created the guitar licks, played on Roy Orbison's record, Pretty Woman. When you hear that, da 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 that's two guys from Shreveport. Uh, so, um, it's just been uh, a wonderful, you know, life of, of from beginning from that, uh, those days of our, our youth um, in uh, Shreveport where we all have remained close friends like our music family all of our lives. And uh, we, we all still see each other and, and everybody's still making music and and enjoying life like that. And then later on, you know, of course, I uh, joined BMI as a songwriter, and Frances Preston, this great lady of the music industry who actually was the person who created BMI in Nashville, working with the people, you know, who funded that, that performance uh, rights organization. And, she was uh, hired to organize it and became the chairman of the board, and she's remained a lifelong friend of mine. I actually signed with BMI when I was still a minor, and my mother had to sign the contract. So we still have all of those things. And, um, and then I began writing this rhythm and blues, and um, uh, Alton's cousin, Myra Smith, and I co-wrote a lot of songs together. Shelby Singleton, uh, was from Shreveport and his wife and we all uh, gathered up at the Louisiana Hayride every Saturday night and that's how you know we all were performers on the Hayride and uh, we became just really close friends because of the Louisiana Hayride. So <clears throat> when was your first number one? Well uh, when I uh, moved to Nashville the Hayride unfortunately uh, was uh, closed down. KWKH was the producer of the Hayride, and their uh, manager, the manager of the station, was killed in a car wreck. He's the one that, you know, kind of kept it going, and a lot of uh, the people, you know, that had produced it had moved away, and Johnny Horton uh, was the last great star of the Hayride. Tillman Franks was the manager of the Hayride, and when Johnny was killed in this tragic car accident in 1960, um, and Tillman was injured, he was in the car with him, and when that happened, you know, there was really nobody to keep producing the show, so it closed down, and uh, there was an exodus, actually, from Shreveport to Nashville. Many, many musicians, and myself included, I moved to Nashville to be in the music business because if you wanted to continue, you know, your career. So um, I began um, a career as a songwriter in Nashville and worked with a friend of ours, Shelby Singleton, who had um, left uh, Shreveport to go to work for Mercury Records and he became an executive with Mercury Records. Then he started his own label, eventually bought Sun Records from Sam Phillips. So Shelby was uh, producing new artists and he wanted me to come in and write songs for his publishing company and Myra Smith also. So we both signed a publishing deal with, with Shelby and we started making records. And he was bringing in these rhythm and blues artists and Johnny Adams was one of them. And um, so he said, I'm gonna cut this guy, uh, Johnny Adams from New Orleans, and um, we're gonna cut him in Nashville. Jerry Kennedy was on the session, had great musician from Shreveport area. And uh, so uh, he said, uh, we went in to meet with him and uh, Myra and I, and he said, I, I want y'all to write me some songs for Johnny Adams. So we did, and um, 
we came up with Reconsider Me. And it was like a two-day assignment. And we went in that afternoon and completed that song and demoed it that night in his style, wrote it in that style with the falsetto. And I, I did all the singing and the parts and Myra played, she was a great guitar player. And so we did the demo, went in the next morning and uh, Shelby loved it, and Johnny Adams came in, and they all loved it. And we went, we recorded it that afternoon. They released it like the next week, and it shot up the charts, and it was number one uh, in the Billboard Rhythm and Blues charts in a matter of weeks. Uh, so that was kind of the way the business was back then. And then we began all of this uh, songwriting, you know, for artists, Jeannie C. Riley. I had a lot of uh, top 10 number one hits with her. And this uh, rhythm and blues du duet um, uh, called Peggy Scott and Jojo Benson, they were really huge uh, rhythm and blues artists. And they did the first cut on Soul Shake. And it was a number one uh, R&B. In, and then Bonnie and Delaney, as I mentioned previously, uh, loved it and they, they cut it and it went uh, in the top 100 and so it was just kind of you know as a songwriter <clears throat> something I love to do and wrote a lot of songs uh, you know for different people and fortunate to have songs cut by Dolly Parton, Loretta Lynn, Conway Twitty you know uh, different people like that um, and uh, so it was just this thing that you do when you become a professional songwriter and um, and then I, I stopped actually recording uh, as an artist and devoted my time, got into production, publishing. You learn, learn the business of the industry, which is very interesting to me. And I think if anyone has that ambition to learn um, the business, it's very advantageous in today's world because it's so difficult to find a publisher or a person, you know, who will support you and until you kind of get started on your own today, which actually I did. I, you know, I toured with the band and was on the road a while. And uh, everybody pays their dues to learn. But uh, that was what, uh, you know, was the current that kept me uh, active in the business. And then love intervened. And uh, Alton and I had dated before I moved to Nashville. And one summer we, we got a chance to be together and, um, and he got in hot pursuit and proposed. And uh, we decided to get married and I moved back to Shreveport in 1981. And uh, just been the most wonderful life, great decision. And Louisiana, unfortunately, had had not developed its music industry in the state, and it I, it was so sad when I went back and saw this great building, this great Art Deco auditorium in Shreveport, is where the Louisiana Hayride was broadcast from live every Saturday night, and it, it the, the city was going to tear it down, and it's just this treasure, this architectural treasure, with acoustics you know, designed like Carnegie Hall. And so Alton, in his career, he had become political uh, representative for a big uh, corporation, the gas and oil industry in Shreveport, and he knew all the politicians. So uh, I said, can we do something to save this building? Uh, so he called uh, some of his friends in the legislature and we, we did a luncheon and and I pleaded the cause, you know, for the Louisiana Hayride building, and, and uh, they, the state actually came up with the funding to save the building, and we helped to organize uh, the force uh, behind that, and it's uh, now still standing in great condition, and uh, then Alton and I took on the, the war, if you will, to save the Louisiana Hayride. Uh, unfortunately, some interlopers that uh, had, um, you know, uh, 
un, uh, well, I want to say the right, I don't want to say the wrong word, I want to say the right word, but they were releasing uh, old records from the Hayride bootleg and infringing on the names of the artist and the records and the recording and, and using the Louisiana Hayride in a very uh, illegal manner. So we took on that challenge to uh, uh, stop all of that, and we've been very successful. In fact, had uh, have a federal ruling at, that gives us the rights to the name Louisiana Hayride, and uh, we're in the process now of starting the show up again. So we're going to bring in all kinds of music, and Tony, we want you to be there and sing on the Louisiana <clears throat> Hayride on the very stage where Elvis Presley and Hank Williams and Johnny Cash and all of the great ones began. Well, I would love and be honored to do that. Okay. Um, one final question. If you had just one piece of advice to give a new songwriter, what would you say? That's a big question. One piece of advice. Well, first of all, you have to love it. You have to love this business. You have to love music. It's love and courage, I think, are the two most important things. Um, first of all, you have to love the music. You have to love the music of your own heart, uh, the music that you love, whatever genre it is. And today there are many, many styles, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to choose from. That, and the kids today, you know, they love their own music, they have their own thing. But a lot of the kids, you know, are, are going back to the roots music. And, um, and of course, all the music that came from New York, the Tin Pan Alley, the Irving Berlin, you know, the George Gershwin, that fabulous music. Uh, all of our American pop singers, Tony Bennett and, and Frank Sinatra and these young artists uh, who have blended some of that style, you know, into their, their music. But the music that you love, um, first of all, you have to know that that's what you really want to try to do. And you have to work it in, you know, with work, responsibilities. I, I did all that. I had, I've always worked. My mother was a, you know, really go-getter. And she said, I'm not raising any lazy kids. And so we all had jobs at the movies, the drugstore, the five and dime. And this industrious uh, attitude and respect for life, you know, the fact that you're born in this world, that you live, you exist, you're a miracle. Each person is a miracle blessed from heaven to be here and that we have um, uh, to dedicate your life, you know, to something that you truly believe in that's going to make a great positive impact in the world because each life links into another and what you do is very important uh, each person has to know that they're so valuable that they're precious creations of God and that they're called they all have a calling to do something um, really significant in life and that, I think, has to be the first thing. And then as far as the techniques, they have you to teach them these um, methods and understanding of how to write uh, significant songs, authentic songs. If it's authentic to your being, to who you are, somebody's going to like it because our souls communicate with each other and we're kindred spirits. And if you have something you write from your heart, it's going to uh, resonate and vibrate to another. And so you're giving of yourself and your life experience, whether it's um, um, the blues, whether you've had a painful experience in life, or whether it's from a joyful occasion or a comedy. You know, it's all these emotions that we're so blessed to live as part of our lives. And I think that would be the most important thing, is to understand your heart and to seek that understanding. It doesn't come easy uh, for anybody, but each person knows that there's something you know they want to say and they want to be heard. And I think um, 
going to people like you for education in this field, that speeds it up so much. You, you, there's a lot of time that could be wasted, you know, just kind of rambling around in circles, not knowing what you're doing. <clears throat> there's, you know, forms in songwriting that, that you need to learn. And you know that, Tommy. You, you understand this songwriting craft. And I think that's what uh, a young songwriter needs to seek is the understanding of the craft and then the understanding of how to blend the emotion with the art and the craft. Well, Maggie Warwick, thank you very much. Fantastic, fascinating uh, story. Thank you. And actually could have done another two or three hours, but um, I'm going to have to finish it there. Uh, good luck with the new project, and I look forward to seeing you in Shreveport. Absolutely, Tony. You're a regular member of the band. <laughs> okay. That's... I go on and